what would you say like your origin story into uh. like <laughs> You know, automotive and then the YouTube community Oof. and, you know. So this is a long, I can go on a long, long. I got plenty of memory here. So All right. <laughs> All right. Let's get into it. So we'll start with automotive because there's a lot of backstory that people maybe don't know. Um, so I've been into cars since I was a little kid. So my my dad was a car guy. My granddad he had he had a Honda dealership, funny enough, hmm. uh, at one point selling like motorcycles and stuff. My dad was into dirt bikes and whatever. And then cars growing up, you know, my dad would tell me all the stories about he had Trans Am, smoking the Bandit Trans Am and hopped it up and got tickets and all this stuff. And uh, my granddad restored, he had a car restoration shop at one point. And like just as a kid, he had cars. Like he was a big uh, G body guy. Like he had El Caminos. I bought my grandma's Monte Carlo recently. Well, that was like a year ago now. I'm slacking. Uh, but I'm just torn on which direction to go with it. But anyway, uh, he had, man, there's a, two vehicles I wish I could get. Like he had a ramp truck, like the square body Chevy ramp truck. But it was like, you know how in the like 80s they did those like upfitting things where they put like the captain shares and the curtains and all the yeah. wood. It was like that, but a ramp truck. I love ramp trucks. I uh, do. Me too. A special place for him. And that one, man, I, I it was like as I got older and uh, was like, I want a ramp truck. I asked my grandma, I'm like, what happened to it? You know, and she, it got sold to some guy. And I think he maybe he still has it. Maybe I'll try to buy it one Finnegan day. Finnegan probably knows where it is somehow. Right. It was. Like it was he knows cool where one. all of them are. Right. <laughs> Every single one. At any point. It was. Uh, it was a really. Cool, Finnegan hit me up when I bought my bus. He's like, if you ever want to sell that thing, and I was <laughs> yeah. like, I knew this would be right up your alley. He's the guy. <laughs> He's the guy. But uh, yeah, so. You know, I was into cars from a young age. I always wanted cars. And, like, I was kind of a, a weird kid in the sense that, like, I would just research stuff. And, like, I was the kid at, like, 10, 11 years old that I would, like, join. Like, I'd see a video. Like, a good example of this is I saw this, like, Volvo, like, square, you know, 80s, 90s Volvo, like, drifting with 500 horsepower. It's just doing donuts. And I'm like, well, how do you do that? Like, I want that, you yeah. know? So I joined the Volvo for him and I'm like, Hey, what kind of Volvo do I need? <laughs> you know, like I'm about to buy a Volvo. I'm like 11. I'm not buying a Volvo, but that's what I would do. And I would yeah. research it and like, didn't know. figure it out, you know, and learn about it. And my dad had bought this Porsche 914 for like a thousand bucks. Um, and you know, we would like tinker on it together and I wanted one of those. So I researched everything into those. And so I wanted cars forever. And like, I, as I was a kid, I would get excited to drive the lawnmower cause I had a steering wheel. I'm like, I'm driving, you know? Yeah. And, um, I had dirt bikes as a kid too. You know, my dad got a Z 50 for like 50 bucks, which those things. Well, wait, I, I still get excited to drive my lawnmower. Yeah, it's same, still fun. Same, same, yeah, yeah, same. Okay. I just got a remote control one. It's pretty cool. Just wanted to, you know, everybody. That's out true. There, but so, like, I would still I, fun. <laughs> I would pretend like I was driving like a truck or a yeah. car around, you know, and like I was going around town. Like I don't know why I wanted to grow up, but it, so I had a dirt bike too. Uh, my dad got a Z50 for fifty bucks when I was like five, which it's crazy because it was a seventies one. Like the round tank, those things are like two, three, four grand now. Mm -hmm. They're really expensive. With fifty bucks, he got that one. I, I started riding as a Anything kid. Anything for fifty bucks is yeah, you know, a good deal. I mean, it, he didn't have a truck. I remember he brought it home in the trunk of his car and like had a coat hanger holding the trunk closed, you know. Um, but had that for a while, and I would just ride around the yard. And then his friend needed some money, so he bought like a, a little bit newer Z fifty from him for like a couple hundred bucks and a two stroke. And I liked the dirt bike thing, and I spent a lot of time on dirt bikes. Um, but cars are always my thing. And it's funny. I, my, his friend, his friend's brother, son raced like the motorcycle equivalent of like a shifter cart. Mm -hmm. It was like mini motorcycles, like six speed, whatever. And he was going to start making parts for them. And he wanted me to like go train with his nephew and learn how to ride him and like race on his team. Like that was going to happen. But then his brother got divorced and like moved from California back here, and then like it all fell apart. But I think about that, I'm like, dude, I, I can't imagine like how cool it would it have been if I started some motorsport at 11, you know? Yeah. Like that would have been neat, but obviously I went a different direction. So as I got older, I didn't really have a hobby when I didn't my, have my license, and I started riding BMX, and that kind of like became my thing and took over. And I started, I had an 84 El Camino, it was my granddad's, that was my first car. And then I traded that for a Porsche 944 non-turbo, like a red one. If you've seen 16 Candles, like the movie car that the dude has. Um, and at that time, it was slow. 
And I was like, man, I just want to like, I just want something fast. And then I kind of gave up on making it fast. Even then you were like, this thing's slow. slow. Yeah. I mean, make like 150 horsepower. Yeah. But you know? I figured because you were so like entry level, you know, going from like an El Camino to that. Yeah. I mean, it was like when I, when I had the El Camino, all I wanted was something stick shift. I was like, I just want to, I almost traded it for like a two door neon. Just because yeah. I wanted a stick shift. And then this 944 popped up. I got it. My dad went with me on that first trade. And I kind of became like addicted to trading cars at a young age because I couldn't afford to modify them. But so I had it. I wanted to put coil. I'm like, it's too slow. I'm just going to slam it. That was the other thing I was kind of like into. I was like, I either want to go fast or I want to have like a slammed car, you know. But coil over for those Very cars. BMX of you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because I was still riding then. So it was like, you know, and uh the coilovers for those cars, like every other car you could get cheap coilovers for, but those cars, the cheapest coilovers were like 1600 bucks back then. And I'm working at Steak and Shake making 725 an hour. That was my first job. And uh, so I couldn't afford it. Mm-hmm. So I went on the forums and I asked what every person with a non-turbo 944 asked, which is like, how do you turbo it? And the question you get from everybody or the answer you get from everybody is sell it and buy a turbo one. And, like, in reality, they are absolutely right because the Turbo One's got better brakes, better transmission, and heat shields, whatever, and they weren't a crazy amount different money-wise then. Yeah, it was engineered to be It would have cost you way more to yeah. make yours turbo. But there was this one guy who was like, hey, I'm supercharging my NA one. I live in Longwood, which is, like, close to you if you want to come check it out. So I went, I, I went and met up with him. His name was Elliot. And uh, he had, like, that one. He had a Turbo one and whatever. And the day I was going to meet up with him to check out his cars after school, because I was still in high school, uh, my 944, they have, like, the battery boxes over the ECU, and water collects there, and it rusts there. And when it rains heavy, it just drenches the ECU and floods the ECU. So that happened to me, like, leaving school, which is so funny, because I'm, like, leaving school, I'm just, like, stuck in one of the lanes leaving school, and everyone's like, what's going on? And so I... I ended up going down there anyway. He loaned me an ECU. I put mine in rice, and it fixed it. I had to do that three times with that car. I just ECU car won't run, put yeah. the ECU in rice, runs. But uh, so we kind of became friends, and he took me for a ride in his turbo one, and it was like the fastest car I'd ever been in at that point. You know, it spun the tires in second, and he was like, "Hon," and then he drifted it, and I still like wasn't interested in drifting. I was just like, "I need something fast, like you know, right now." So I posted my 944 for trade and couldn't really find anything great. And I ended up trading for a 240, an S13 coupe, like beige. Like, honestly, nowadays a pretty nice car, but I kind of immediately, like, had buyer's remorse because it came with, like, a turbo kit, but it was really, like, some diesel truck turbo, no manifold, some too big. need for speed body kit, like a KA bare block, like because it was still KA. Yeah. And I was just like, oh no, I screwed up. Like my Porsche was so nice and like red, black interior. So I'm looking and I find this 944 turbo for sale. And it's like someone had sanded it to flat blue and they just never painted it. And the dude's like, lists all these things he's done to it. And he's like, we'll trade for anything non-German. Like, he was over it. So I hit him up, and I'm like, hey, I've got this S13. I, like, tried to really sell him on it. He's like, dude, I had one just like it. It got wrecked. Like, I want another one. I'm down. And I was like, wow. He's down. And I had just registered it. What are the chances? I know, right? (laughs) And I I was waiting for the title to come in the mail. And from to this day now, I always get the titles printed, even though I don't plan on getting rid of stuff. Just because that, I was like, just anxiety for like a week and a half waiting for the title to come in because I couldn't trade him until it came in. So I tell Elliot about it, and Elliot's like, oh, I wanted to buy that car. And I'm like, no, like, please don't buy it. Like, let him trade me. And he's like, look, I went and looked at it. It's got a factory limited slip diff. He's like, that's really rare. He's like, so I'll make you a deal. I won't try to buy it, but if you get it, you have to try drifting. And I'm like, okay, dude, whatever. Sounds good. In a Porsche. Yeah, because that's what he drifted. <laughs> yeah. You know? And so that's uh, what was funny to think. Yeah, that's what I started in. Flat blue Porsche, stock yeah. suspension, no angle. And uh, so I did, like, the first street spot we went to, I was like, I don't know why he tried to teach me there. It was a bunch of curbs. But I didn't crash it. But I was, like, trying to learn how to drift, whatever, and then started drifting. And that's that's how I got into drifting. You know? It was really just total random, you know? Um you may be one of the only people that got into drifting through a Porsche 
Yeah, four four. <laughs> probably because he was like the only other guy that drifted. There's one guy like in Iceland, yeah, who like drifted. Like, one. You may be the only person that entered drifting through. Yeah, and it was a tough way to enter because like, the, so the car I got that car and, and from getting rid of a 240. Yeah, I know that's what's so funny. It's a, such a weird. Story. You would think like when you get to the two, like oh that's how you started drifting. Yeah, you, you got, got to the 240. Then it's like no, actually it never. No, drifted the 240. That. I didn't even know 240s drifted then. Mm-hmm. I just like wanted something fast. The arguably better car. For we definitely the job. a better car for it. Yeah, <laughs> and the the Porsche was so tough because there was like no. I mean, angle kits weren't even hardly a thing back then. Like cut knuckles was like you're balling if you got cut knuckles. But like you know, non-working handbrakes, stock suspension, coilovers are expensive. So I'm running like there's pictures of the car like. What are like two feet of body roll, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm like holding on to the center console. The weights all the way in the back. Yeah, so it made it a little tricky. And uh but yeah, I started drifting it and it was like I wasn't, you know, expecting to like it as much as I did, but I did. But two weeks after I bought the car, I went to go do an oil change and it was like gonna I've never done like my own oil change, like any real project on the car. And I see my friends riding BMX across the street. So I, like, drive over there, and I'm like, what's up, guys? And, of course, they're like, do a burnout. And I was like, all right, I'll do a burnout. I do a burnout, and then I hear this, like, grinding noise. And I was like, oh, that's weird, you know? So I'm driving home, and I I keep making it do it. If I floor it, it's like, like this horrible grinding noise. So I get home. I'm, like, looking on the forums. I can't find anything conclusive. I go to go to work, still working at Steak and Shake, and I, like, leave the light, and then I just have no gears, like nothing. First suit, sixth, fifth. No reverse, nothing. I'm like, oh, no. So I get it towed home, drain the fluid. The transmission, transaxle's fine. Um, And what it ended up being is, like, the torque tube, you have, like, the spline shaft going both ways, and then you have, like, a coupler over top of them, and it stripped the torque tube side. So I had to change the torque tube on a Porsche 944, and I haven't even done an oil change Mm -hmm. myself. So it took me two weeks the first time, and – there's a long story with step parents and stuff, but I wasn't, I was on, I had to be on my own insurance plan. I had to pay my own insurance from start. Like I wasn't allowed to be on a family plan and I wasn't allowed to drive any of my dad's cars. So for two weeks in summer, I had to ride my BMX bike to steak and shake to work and then ride it home. And in then, Florida? In Florida. Okay. Yeah. And it's actually kind of right where I live now. And then ride home and work on the car. And I don't know what I was doing for two weeks. Because, like, I remember working on it till, like, 3 a.m. every night and then going to work because it was summer, so, like, I yeah. wasn't going to school. It's like, what was a full day like working on no power to And do getting nothing tube? done. I mean, it's a big job because you yeah. got to drop the, the transaxle. But well, two weeks of, you know, I, well, what? Days. I don't know, you know? And I know I was, like, I was working, but, I mean, the one problem we had is, like, to drop the transaxle, it has to come straight down. So you've got to slide the coupler like over the transmission side, but because it was stripped, it wouldn't slide. So I spent like three days trying to slide this coupler through this little access hole, and then it was a nightmare. I put it back together, had a bag of leftover bolts, like a bunch of heat shields, but it worked. You know, it happened two more times. The second time we did it in like eight hours. But I, I had no yeah. experience, and I had to rip most of the drivetrain out of a car, you know, and that was my introduction to that car. And that car fought me until the day I got rid of it, dude. That, that car, I, I I was going to high school. I get to school, I park, and then I there's this, like, football kid that I knew, and he's like, hey, man, I think your car is leaking. And I'm like, no. They, they, well, I had paid for a senior spot so you could park up front, and you got to paint the spot, but I didn't care. I just wanted a good parking spot because I always got there late. So mine was painted like a Dalmatian from the girl before me. So I was like, he just saw that. Like, he doesn't know cars. And I get out there and, dude, there's a river of oil in front of my car. And I'm like, oh, he was right. Impossible. <laughs> yeah. So I get it. My buddy flat toes me home, and it, the oil. I cracked the oil pan. I don't even know when it happened, but it's aluminum, cast aluminum oil pan. I cracked it. So to change it on all that, it was like a 20-hour job. And I'm like, not doing that. So I took it to my buddy's sh- dad's shop. He fixed, like, jet skis and boats. And... I like, I think I just like I left it there, and then I rode my bicycle with like a backpack full of oil, like six miles down there. We JB welded the oil pan, and it worked. It held. Uh, the rear shock bolt was zip tied in because it had stripped out of the control arm because it's torsion bars in the rear yeah. too. So 
it was a mess, dude. And and this guy I knew, he's a BMW guy. Uh, he worked at PSI, and it was cool because I used to go over there. My two friends worked there and, like, see these crazy, like, twin supercharged M6s and stuff. And he stumbled upon this dude trading a turbo E36 sedan, like a really nice car. And he said, we'll trade for a 951, which is a 944 turbo. So I hit the dude up. He's in Virginia. And I made sure to tell him most of the stuff with the car because I'm like, I'm not trying to tow this thing to Virginia. And this dude says no. So, but he was still down. He thought the E36 had a blown head gasket. So I convinced my friend's dad to to tow my car up there and so I can trade and tow this car back. Yeah. And, dude, the nightmare trip. I think it's why I'm so paranoid about breaking down towing now. Like, it was a 24-valve second-gen Cummins. And, like, as soon as we got into Georgia, it started, like, acting weird where it would, like, hesitate. And you have to, like, put it in neutral, rev it. It would clear up. And we kept going. And eventually it was getting bad. So we stopped on an off-ramp, like, in North Carolina or something. We got back on the road the next morning, and it was acting up. So we're like, we'll go to a parts store and pull the code. So we get off, we, we go to go to the parts store, like we stall in an intersection and this National Guards dude like tows us into the parking lot. And then we walk into this gas station and they're like talking about it being a national emergency zone. And like a bunch of tornadoes had come through that night while we were just asleep on the side of the road. So we get back going and it's all like the carnage from the tornadoes. It was just, it was horrible, dude. Like at, but, but by the time we got to Virginia, we were going up like this hill bridge and we had to stop about every mile and brake cleaner the intake, the air filter to get it to fire up and go again. It's dedication. If we were commit, I mean, we're already almost there. Yeah. So <laughs> the dude wasn't even home. We had to like trade with his dad. We get the car, and I, the whole time I'm thinking on the way up there, I'm like, my car works. The car I'm trading for doesn't work. So like, worse comes to worse, like I can drive my car home, but not this car I'm getting. Yeah. And we stayed at a hotel, and like two miles in the next day, same thing, because we were like, maybe we'll give it a rest, like and it'll be fine, and. uh so we look up repair shop and there's a diesel repair shop like two miles away. And we had checked the fuel filter and everything, but there was a like a strainer for the fuel heater that was clogged. So they fixed that and we did 80 the whole way home. Oh. So it was like literally as soon as we got rid of the car, smooth sailing trip. Yeah. Like it, that's what I mean. Like it fought us the whole way, dude. It was But then you got into a BMW. Well which the, is also the, way better though. The the funny thing about the BMW, not I love the Porsche 944 turbos too. Like I'm not it just like for learning how to work on a car, it was a very complicated car to learn how to work on. Um the BMW, I the guy thought it needed a head gasket. So I just went, I like checked the coolant was brown. So I was like, oh, it's got oil, like it needs a head gasket. I didn't know, you know. So I did like the back then it was always like thicker head gasket, head studs on those motors, um, the turbo M52s. So I did that. Um, that was my graduation present was like the, the head gasket. And um, so I had no car again. I fixed that and it still was having the issue. And all it ended up being was the fuel pump had fallen out of the hangar. And it was like sucking to the bottom of the tank. So the car, it would suck to the bottom of the tank and the car would like misfire and then it would like free itself. So like all it needed was a $20 fuel pump, but yeah. I did a head gasket on it. Um, Just because. Yeah. See, that to me, like I'm like, I remember in high school, like that was, that was terrifying to me was like my car being broken. It sucked. Was like the worst case scenario. And, you know, granted I live 45 minutes from my high school, so it's. Pretty, okay, yeah, that's pretty far. It was unfortunate <laughs> yeah. when, you know, your car was having issues in any way. Right. Like, that was, it was like 45 minutes of, like, you know, also just miles. So yeah. So it was like, <laughs> right. it was rough. Yeah, that's a long way. So it was always, like, the biggest fear. I was like, man, like, if the car is down. What am I going to do? Yeah, but you seem like you were pretty comfortable with, like, oh, yeah. Well, the car breaks sometimes. Yeah, it you was, know? you know, I was, I, I had the Porsche for, like, a year and a half. And I was like the kid in high school. It was like straight piped turbo, so it was loud. Mm -hmm. And I'd show up late. My friend would text me like, "You just got to school, didn't you?" You know. And I would I had on job training because I had my credits or whatever, so I'd leave at lunch. And there was like four of us that left at lunch. And when I had my red 944, I had to go and exit down on I4. So it's like I'd come out of school, get on I4, one exit, get off. And like there was like four of us, and we would just race from one exit to the next to like 130, just floored mm -hmm. until the exit. And someone that knew my dad or this step parent uh, saw that, saw me do that. And then I got like my car taken away, even though it was in my name and my insurance. There's a whole lot there. I won't get into that. But 
basically, yeah, I worked at Steak and Shake, started drifting, Porsche, E36. Then there was a bunch of trades after that. Like, I was trading up for a while, then I had some bad trades. But, like, I, I only made enough money to survive. So, like, I couldn't buy parts for my car. So it was like, oh, my car doesn't have coilovers, but I can trade for this car that does, you know. So I did a lot of trading. Like, I was a regular at the DMV. Um, but I, yeah, I traded a lot, worked at Steak and Shake, um, Got a job at Advanced. Like, I had applied online, forgot about it, and they called me. And I went and interviewed there. Because it was so hard to get my job at Steak and Shake. Like, I interviewed, like, five places. Nobody wanted to hire me. And then I got the job at Steak and Shake. I'm like, I finally have a job. Yeah. Because I wasn't – I couldn't drive until I could get my own insurance, you know? So I get the job at Advanced. I'm like, this is the dream job. I get to work at a parts store, you know? This is great. And uh, I started working there as a counter person. And there was the commercial guy, Butch, which – and he started, like, kind of teaching me how to do the commercial side because nobody wanted to talk to anybody but Butch. Like, if they called and it, he wasn't there, they're like, I'll call back. So th- I, they started, like, trusting me, talking to me, and then the general manager there hated him. So he tried to get him fired, and they were like, he's too good at his job. So they moved him to another store, which is funny enough where I go get parts now. So he's now my parts guy, like, 12 years later because oh, okay. I was, like, 19. But yeah, so I still, took, still ripping on him. He's it. still doing commercial. But uh, so I took over for like the two weeks that they were looking for a replacement and it was fine. Like everything carried on as usual. The customers like me, but they were like insistent. They're like, we can't have a 19 year old in this position. Like it needs to be like an older person. Like they wouldn't give me the job, even though I wanted it. So they hired this guy and this guy is probably the biggest pathological liar I've ever met in my life, dude. So he says he's got 20 years experience and all this, you know, all these snap on tools and whatever. And I was like, dude, this guy is full of it. So I was telling my friends, they're like, no, I don't believe you. I'm like, watch. I called him, like, I wasn't at work. And I'm like, hey, I need a piston return spring for a Mitsubishi Galant. And I made up some customer account. He's like, oh, I haven't heard from you in a while. Like, it didn't even exist. And he's like, oh, yeah, I got the snap on tool for that, for removing those piston return springs. They're a pain. And I'm oh, like, nice. And then he's like, I can't find it in here. I'm like, that's weird. Like, it's in there. <laughs> But so, like, the guy didn't know anything. and uh, Shocking at a parts store. Yeah, I know. But he was the commercial guy that, yeah. like, they they made me not have the job. So, anyway, the customers, like, basically revolted, which did feel pretty cool when I was 19. They were like, if you don't put Taylor in the position, like, we're done. Mm-hmm. Like, we're just not going to – because this guy's an idiot, this other guy. So, I got the job. Uh, I was, like, by far the youngest commercial guy. And um, that guy – knew now – all the local shops. Yeah, yeah, because I knew, like, they'd call me, and i know by voice, yeah. you know, and I, you know, I would hustle. Like, I had two computers, two phones, so I'd answer. They'd tell me, like, what part. I'd be looking it up, and I'd answer the other phone, and, like, I was hustling. But uh, I was like, oh, so he started working counter, and this is just how much of a pathological liar is. One day, he's like, I got to go. I got to go. My, my whatever, I just got the call that my – uncle or granddad his last name was garrett he's like i got the call that my whatever passed away and i'm inheriting garrett like honeywell garrett oh uh they're picking me up on the private jet in 30 minutes (laughs) and i'm flying there because i'm inheriting billion millions of dollars yeah and dude everybody else in that store bought it from the auto parts store to yeah i'm like dude (laughs) owner of (laughs) a multi probably billion dollar corporation yeah that, um, that guy, supplying man. company. <laughs> <laughs> that guy, man. He was so... I don't know whatever happened to him. He oh, but, inherited Garrett. And, oh, yeah, true. Well, I, he was still there, I think, when I quit. So Now he's one of your sponsors, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm not sponsored by Garrett. Oh, not yet. I figured they were on the... Uh, no, one day, hopefully. Because um, I need some turbos from a, my RX-7. But, yeah, this is all relevant to the story of the YouTube. I'm just giving you context. So... Well, we can talk to the best turbo supplier in the country, uh, Precision. I know. Yeah, give me your contact info because I need some turbos. But anyway, so advanced, work there, commercial. I had a, like, kind of a life crisis where I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like, I had planned on going to college, and then I was like, I finished high school and just, like, didn't, you know? And I was like, I need to go back to college. And my dad had always told me he would pay for my college because he didn't go to college but he ended up doing really well, like quality assurance in the aerospace industry without mm-hmm. a degree. But he was always like, if you want to go, whatever. So I, in high school, I did like the AP courses. I did like two years of a second language. Like I did all the stuff to get the Bright Future scholarship thing. So I'm like, I need to go back to college. 
So I decide to quit commercial and go to part-time. My boss gets mad, so he gives me zero hours. So I just quit and went to O'Reilly's part-time. Started going to college. It was only like 800 bucks a semester once everything was paid for. Um, but it was like pulling teeth to get my dad to pay that, which my dad was a good guy for sure. Like he did a lot for us. This, he was in between a rock and a hard place. But semester and a half in, my the, I had to move out. I was I got kicked out with like three days notice. Like on a Wednesday, I was told I had to be gone by Friday. And I'm like, dude, I just quit my good job yeah. to go to school, and now I got to get a full-time job again. So I moved into this like $500 one room self-efficiency it was like five units dude it was so sketchy like my neighbor was like this disabled guy and then like his sister and her boyfriend were living there and they were definitely selling his medications next door like it was super wow. sketch but i needed to find a full-time job so i the i found a job at this dealership this used car dealership and that was weird dude i still am convinced i don't know if it's still there it was like some sort of front like either they were shipping cars to saudi arabia Something weird was going on because it was like uh, well, there was like areas you like could not go without a key code or whatever. Like, but like very like it was weird. And one day I walked by a room and the dude had like a hundred monitors. Like he was just watching every area of the dealership and like the main dude was like sketchy. But anyway, I I got a job there as a service rider, and this dude trains me. And then the next day he's not there, and I'm like, where's the dude that's training me? They're like. It's you. And I'm like, I had one day of training and you want me to be a service writer? I'm like, what? <laughs> so I was like, difficult okay. ass dealership job. Right. I'm like, I'll, I guess I'll just figure it out. So I'm like trying to figure it out as I go. And everybody I talk to, I'm like, how long have you been working here? And they're like, two months, a month, three months. And I'm like, this is not looking good. Like, everyone who's here is fresh. Mm -hmm. So I had a job opportunity to work construction with a friend of mine. So I ended up taking that job and it sucked. Dude. It was like brutal. Like I would work, like I'd get to work at like five in the morning and generally get back at like eight or nine at night every day, five days a week. Um, but it's like, even at Steak and Shake, like if I do something, I want to be good at it. Like that's just the way I am. So like, I wanted to be the best grill cook at Steak and Shake, you know? And like, I wanted to be the best at this construction job. And it was rewarding because like you're building stuff. Um, but I ended up being like the main person for installs pretty quickly, but I just, like, it sucked because there was like the boss, he was all right. But there was a guy who did the fab work in the shop. Cause we did these like commercial awnings. Like we do like the standard ones, like canvas ones are like big, like metal structures, whatever. Uh, he was just it's so annoying. Like we come back from like a 16 hour day and he has a nine to five building stuff in the shop. They're hammered drinking beer, and they're like, dude, someone didn't replace the toilet paper roll. And it's like, dude, are you really complaining about that right now? Yeah. Like, we've been gone for 16 hours. So I hate it. shop guys complaining to the installers. Yeah, like about toilet paper in the shop. Like, yeah. come on, dude. Or he'd be like, oh, you, you know, like, no matter how fast you got the job done, it was never fast enough, you know? And it's like, dude, I don't want to be gone for 16 hours. You think I'm, like, dilly-dallying out there? So I hated the job, and then... I would I'd become friends with Chelsea and my buddy Grafton, Andrew, who I lived with, was friends with Chelsea and me, Chelsea, Grafton, Engelman, and David, we all went on a BMX ride in the trails in Ocala. And Chelsea was like, Hey, uh, do you like your job? And I'm like, No, dude, I hate my job. And he's like, Oh, there's an opening at BC. You know, if you want, I can get you an interview. And I was like, sick, perfect. Like, I'm down. So then he hits me up. I I go to work. My boss sends us home early, which is unusual at two o'clock. He's like, I want you to leave for Alabama at two in the morning tomorrow for like three weeks. So Chelsea's like, hey, I can get you an interview next week. And I'm like, I'm going to be in Alabama. And I never quit a job without having another job lined up. But I, I was like, you know, I got to chance it. So I quit on the spot, which was a mess, but I quit because <laughs> the guy who would install with me didn't have a license. So, like, there was no one for you to go. My boss came to my house at 2 in the morning and was like, come on, you're leaving. I'm like, no, dude, I'm not going. Like, I'm done. So I panicked, and I got another job immediately. Like, I found a job working as a tech at this shop because I thought that because I'd swapped a couple SRs, I knew how to work on cars, and I learned that that was not the case. Like, swapping an SR and a 240 is not the same as doing a timing belt on an Audi. Yeah. You know? So I started working at this shop. And there's a pretty funny story there. The shop foreman, he like, he's like, bring in that uh, minivan. 
And I'm like waiting to hear back from BC at this point. Maybe I hadn't gone to the interview yet. Um, he's like, bring in this minivan and like, tell me what's wrong with the transmission. Like it only has reverse or something. So I bring it in and I'm looking at it and there's like an inch of RTV, like all around the transmission pan. And I like tell him, I'm like, Hey man, whoever rebuilt this transmission, like had no idea what they were doing. Like they put way too much RTV, probably got sucked up in there and destroyed the transmission. And he just like grunts and walks away. And then the other tech comes over. He's like, Hey man, he rebuilt that transmission. (laughs) And I was like, Oh no. (laughs) So he hated me from then on out. Um, and I went to the BC interview. I lied and said I was going to lunch or something, made up some story. Cause it was like Mm -hmm. 45 minutes away. So it was like another huge gamble of like, I'm probably going to lose this job if I go to this interview, but I did it anyway. And I did lose the job because I went to the interview and then I didn't hear back. And I was like, you know what? Last time when I quit my construction job, I was so like, I've got to get another job. I was like, I should have, like, I got a job in a day. Like I should have just enjoyed it. Yeah. So at this point I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to just give it some time. See if the BC thing works out. This was probably the last time in my life that I'm going to not have a job you know, to where I can just like not have a job, probably work the rest of my life. So might as well make the most of it. And my buddy Crosby was in that same position and we hung out. It was a great two weeks. We just like hung out and were bums for two weeks, but I just kept going back to BC. And, uh, eventually they gave me a second interview and they hired me. And then I found out that the guy, the shop guy who would complain at my construction job knew the general manager at BC and told him that I was like a terrible employee and not to hire me. Ah. So I almost didn't get hired at BC because of that. Just because of the other job. Yeah. And that guy was a a jerk. But anyway, this is how I don't hold grudges. I still know him, talk to him. I don't care. Uh, But so I started working at BC, ended up in the tech department. We did installs like. What did you start doing at BC? I started at sales, but they had like four salespeople already. And then they only had one tech guy, and then he was gone on, like, he had, like, a uh, family emergency thing and was gone for, like, a month. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yo, guys, like, do you want me to just, like, go do tech? Because, like, there's yeah. nobody there, and there's, like, four of us in sales. So I started doing tech pretty early on. What does a tech position do at BC? Uh, it's just, like, like you deal with if someone's having an issue, you email them, okay, yeah. help them figure so it tech out. Tech support stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, custom build kind of stuff and then also we would do r&d installs so like if there was like a new car that came out we had a new kit we would install it and do all the documentation Mm -hmm. so we also it was kind of rare that we did this but if we sponsored somebody coilovers and installed them like i would install them so this is how i met adam cody the marketing guy there he's like hey you used to ride bmx like you know do you know this adam guy from youtube and at the time like I only knew YouTube for like car crash compilations, like rally hill climbs. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't know what a YouTuber was. I didn't know that you could subscribe. Like I knew none of this. Um, And I thought he was the other Adam from BMX. You know, I didn't know who he was. Um, So he shows up and he had brought his bike and uh, it was on his E90, his white E90. And I was like, Hey, like I used to ride BMX, kind of like try to do a trick, and I think he probably thought that I meant like I used to like do a bunny hop here and there, and I did like a 360, and he was like, "Oh, like you actually used to ride, you know?" Yeah. And I was like, "Yeah, I got into drifting, and it just kind of like fell off of biking." He's like, "Oh, I want to get into drifting," and we started chatting, and we kind of like became friends. And I, at the time, I'm like, "Get a 240 with an SR in it," because the Z's weren't really a thing then, and um, that was that. Like I didn't really think anything of it because so many people are like, yeah, I want to get into drifting and then like nothing happens. Yeah, I mean, what year was this anyways? Like <sighs> God, when would it be? Like 2014? Yeah, that would probably make sense. 2014-ish. So, somewhere somewhere in that range. Yeah, because Z's were still. Yeah, like it new and, cars. and it wasn't like that concept of like stock simple cars like hadn't really hit yet you know Mm -hmm. and like i hadn't had a working drift car in like three or four years you know so i was kind of like a washed up drifter anyway and i was just like sr 240 get something simple so a couple months later he hits me up on facebook and he's like hey i bought an sr 240 i'm like oh this guy actually did it like he said he was gonna do it like because i still didn't know anything about him you know and uh he's like i his plan was to leave it in connecticut with his with jimmy and only drive it like when he was up there during the summer because he knew car people there, but he didn't know any car people here. And he's like, I want to bring it down. Like, should I? And I'm like, yeah, dude, bring it down. Like, I'll help you. Like, I know people. Like, I'll introduce you to the drift people, tell you when events are, whatever. Yeah. Cause uh, he wasn't like a 
he wasn't like a car guy mechanically right. inclined at the time. Right, exactly. Really, so so, so he didn't want to bring it down here and then have nobody who knew car stuff. He yeah. only knew BMX people down here. Living so on campus, I think. Like right, yeah. You, well, you lived a little bit off, but mm-hmm. yeah, basically. But being yeah. a college student, yeah, yeah, no, no real car garage is odd. Yeah, so I was like, dude, just bring it down. Like I promise, it'll be good. It'll be fine. And he like. It started misfiring. He drove it down, which is crazy to think about now from wherever, Connecticut. Yeah, that's a long drive. Yeah. You know, 40. <laughs> and somewhere, I think in South Carolina, he's like, it started misfiring. And me and my buddy Marco had both had SRs. And we're like, it's a rocker arm. And I had a bag of rocker arms at my house from my SR days. So like, we go over there, we change the rocker arm. And, and like just me and Adam became friends. And he started trying to get me to ride again. And I was like, I probably should because I was in not great shape then. And uh, so I started riding again, and then we went – I'll never forget because we went to Gringos Locos, which he loves, across from Orlando Skate Park. And uh, he's like, you should start a YouTube channel. And he's like, I'll, I'll help you. Like, I'll give you a shout-out to help you, like, get it off the ground. Uh, like, you should do it, you know. And I was like – I had no interest in doing it. Like, it wasn't on my radar. Um, but I was like, you know what, I might as well give it a shot. You know, and the, the girl I was dating at the time was going to full sale. So I'm like, oh, you can edit the videos. Like, this is perfect. You know, you got a Mac, whatever. So I buy a camera, start making videos. She was taking forever to edit them, like a month to edit a video. So I, like, spent all my money, bought a little gaming laptop, and uh, started editing them. And that's pretty much the rest is history, I guess. Yeah, and then you started. What cars were you filming at that moment? Like, So that was the Miata. So when I started... My channel. I'd filmed like a couple videos. Like yeah. I didn't know what I was gonna film. Originally, it's kind of come full circle. Originally, I was like, oh, I'm gonna film like how to videos, like how to drift, like how to stuff. And then once I once I got going in the early days, I turned into like a vlogger because yeah. that's like what I was around. And, and that's what was really big at the time. Right. So like I filmed me going to watch FD. I like, never in a million years filmed me going to watch an FD event now. But I made three videos on each trip yeah. you know so and but now i'm kind of like almost for full circle back to what i envisioned it would be in the beginning you know but uh that's when we did the miata trip and i ended up buying that miata mm-hmm. and in that video he's like oh taylor started a channel so the miata started the channel you know it was like i made a video like starting to work on it got it together went to its first drift event but that car blew up every two events for the first three motors and then i turned out i found out later the injector connectors were like it's like RX-7 injectors, so it's like EV1 style that someone had butt yeah. connected on, and one of the crimps was just like falling apart. So it was like that one injector was losing uh, connection and just melting down that cylinder. So, but I had already like got all the LS stuff together by that point because I was so over it, and I was I, who knows how long the turbo motor would have lasted. Yeah, because those things are not bad motors no dude they're, they're my ben pretty strong ben had a little 161 turbo and like i've never seen someone have more disregard for the mechanical function of a car yeah. never heard it <laughs> like guys thank you for tuning in to the bogetti clips youtube channel for the full podcast check us out on bogetti studios youtube and all your audio platforms also hit that subscribe button to not miss out on any of the new bogetti clips coming up